Good morning, Calvary friends and guests. It was Paul that said, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, as we continue our COVID-19 worship experience, and as the church continues to be deployed throughout the world, may I remind you that although we may be physically distant, physically separated, we are still spiritually connected by the love of God. Welcome to Calvary's Sunday morning worship service.
Rejoice and be glad in it. I am Deaconess Bessie Thornton, and I, along with Deacon Charles Henderson, will be bringing you devotion this morning. I will be doing the scripture, and Deacon Henderson will be doing the prayer. But before we go into the scripture, I'd like to just raise my voice uh, to say thank you to God for just allowing my golden moments to roll on just a little while longer. During this pandemic that we are going through, we've had hurricanes and experienced earthquakes here and tornadoes everywhere. And, you know, we just need to pray for our country as well as each other because God is so good. It could have been us, but by his grace and mercy, he has allowed our golden moments to roll on just a little while longer. So while I'm singing, and if you want to lift your voices with me, please join in. And I've asked my daughter, Greta, to come and join in with me. So we're going to lift our voices and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank to get your Bibles out, I will be reading from 2 Chronicles, and we've seen this on Facebook, uh, preachers are preaching this all over, and it's giving us a directive from God, and he's telling us what we need to do. I'm going to be reading 2 Chronicles, and we'll be coming from chapter 7, and I'm just going to read uh Verses 14 and 15. And it reads, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now my eyes shall be open and my ears attest unto the prayer that is made in this place. And this is the word of God for the people of God. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, Calvary. I'm Deacon Charles Henderson, and I will be ringing this morning's devotional service prayer. Before I get started, I'm just going to offer some words of encouragement to those who are working from home, 
those who are homeschooling, those who um, are on the front lines fighting this pandemic of battle. Um, I encourage you to seek God's face, to lean and depend on him, to trust God that he will bring us through. Although we are fighting an un unseen virus, um, God sees it all. God knows it all. He knows our situations. And so I encourage you to trust God and know that God is with us always. And for those that are in fear, I offer this scripture. This comes from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. And for those who are kind of wrapped around the axle and all caught up in the world as far as what the pandemic is all about and whether or not we've got enough resources and personnel to fight it and who's paying for what, let's not get caught up in that. Because if you don't have a spirit of fear, you don't worry about tomorrow. You don't worry about what you wear. You don't worry about where you're going to go or what you got to put on or none of that stuff or what you're going to eat. So I encourage you to focus on God, to see God's face. Because if you think about it and you go to Romans 12, two, do not be conformed to this world, it tells us, but transformed by the renewal of your mind that thy, by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So this morning, I encourage you to trust God and lean and depend on God. Yeah, it's easy for us to cross our fingers and hope for the best, but the hope we have in Christ is so much more than that. To have hope means to have confident expectations. You say confident expectations. In who? That's in God. Hope may not come naturally to us. And in fact, it doesn't come naturally to many of us because some of us just don't have faith. In order to have faith, you have to have the foundation of hope. But in order, but here's the deal. To have hope, we must know God. To have hope and faith, you have to know God. And our faith is in God. That means that we have to have confident expectations. So as we go before the throne of grace, I encourage you to trust in God, to seek God's face and know that he's in control. Father God, it's once again that we have the honor and the pleasure to come before you to give you thanks and the praise your most blessed and holy name. Father God, we come thanking you because we know no one else that can actually give us the strength and the power that we need to be able to persevere and to press on. When our backs are against the wall, Lord, we know that you're there with us. And we thank you, Father God, for giving us the strength and the understanding that as long as we trust and depend in you, that if you bring us to a storm, you will bring us through the storm. We pray, Father God, and in the name of Jesus, that you continue to watch over those who are fighting the battle on the front lines our first responders, the doctors, the nurses, all of the medical personnel, Lord, and even our policemen, our officers, Lord, who are trying to keep peace and kind of keep order. We pray, Father God, that you bless and watch over them. We pray for those who are still employed, Lord, that are in those positions that are deemed necessary. They are being subjected to potential infections as well. So we pray, Father God, that you strengthen them and encourage them. Father God, we also ask that you continue to bless the families as parents are working from home, students are working from home. We pray that there's harmony and cooperation and peace. Pray, Father God, that you continue to watch over those who are sick, who are affected by this virus, whether it's because they are sick, know someone that is sick, or have lost a loved one. So I ask, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you provide them comfort. Now, God, we don't have all the answers. In fact, your scripture tells us, your word tells us not to lean to our own understanding. So we're not leaning to our own understanding, Father, this morning. In our devotion, Father God, we devote ourselves to you and your purpose and understanding, Father God, that as long as we listen to you and watch for you and to understand what it is that you would have us to do, that you will bring us through. Father God, whatever the situation, whatever the circumstances, whatever the condition, we know, Father God, that you're in control. So we turn it all over to you. 
We trust you, Lord, and we pray, Father God, in a mighty way that you will heal this land, that you will renew our strength, and that you will help us, Lord, to continue to press on, to be all that you would have us to be. We are a church of great expectations, enlisting, engaging, encouraging, and praying, Father God, as we encourage that we will empower one another to do well according to your purpose and according to your will. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done. We pray, Lord God, that you will continue to strengthen and guide our pastor and pray, Father God, that the vision that we have and the mission that we have before us, Father, that you will strengthen us and that you will give us the tools and the resources to be able to achieve the expected and desired outcome. Father God, we pray for the homes that have been impacted by this COVID virus. There are many that are homeless, jobless, those who are sick. We pray, Father God, you know their situation, you know their circumstances, you know their conditions, and we ask, O oh Lord, in a mighty way that you step into their situations, their circumstances, their condition. We ask, Lord, that they continue to hope and to continue to have faith and to have confident expectations and to be patient, Lord, and know that you will show up and show up. We just have to give you time. We always know, we already know, Lord God, that things don't always happen according to our timetable, but when it's right, you will show up and be there right on time. Father God, we pray for our local officials, our state officials, our national officials, and the world officials, Lord. Especially those who are medical personnel who know about this virus, how to get at it, how to, how to, how to, how to maybe hopefully at some point come up with a solution. But if we can't rely on man, which we really shouldn't, we're going to rely on you, Father. You have always come through. When we put our trust in man, man is subject to fail. But if we put our trust in you, Lord, you have always come through victorious. So we seek victory in you, Lord. We seek victory in the battle on the front lines of this pandemic. We seek victory in our households, with our families, with our husbands, our wives, our sisters, our brothers, our children, our friends, our co-workers, and all those around us, Father God. So it is in your name that we come before you this morning, devoting ourselves to your perfect will and your purpose. Asking you, Lord, to teach us, to show us, to guide us and mold us in the way you would have us to go. We pray, Father God, that you continue to watch over us. Help us to be all that you would have us to be. These things we pray most boldly and humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This concludes our devotion this morning. We pray that something is said or done that will help you to know what God has purposed in your life. And I pray that you will continue to not to have a spirit of fear that you not be conformed to this world, but you will be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you will seek the silver lining in this situation, that you have the opportunity to spend with your family, your friends, to get to know the word of God, to get to know one another, and to know that God is in control. Walking around these walls I thought by now they fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the bad one. For you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence you never fail me yet never fail me yet I know the night won't last your word will come to pass 
it was the late Charles Spurgeon that said that prayer is the slender nerve that moves the omnipotent muscle. In other words, prayer is the tool that gets God's attention. God hears the cries of his children. Hebrews 4 and 16 says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. At Calvary Baptist Church, we are praying specifically. We're very intentional and focused in our prayer. We're praying for three things, that God would spiritually heal the land. In that spiritual healing, we're also asking God for physical healing. We're asking God that there would be revival, number two, in the church, that we might be restored in rightful relationship with God. Revival is about a doing. It's about doing that which we once did to bring us close in relationship with God, restoring us in rightful relationship with God our Father. Then third of all, we're praying that the gospel will go forth with power, that those who are unsaved might make a choice and decide to make Jesus their choice. We're praying and we believe that prayer is the answer and faith unlocks the doors. Let's enter into the throne of grace right now. Our Father in heaven, we come right now to thank you for access to the throne of grace. We thank you for power. We thank you, Father, for grace and mercy. We ask, oh God, that you would forgive us of all of our sins. And we thank you that things are as well as they are. We thank you for your provisions. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your promises. Father, we lift up the world in which we live and we ask, oh God, that you would spiritually heal the land. You are the balm in Gilead and we know that you are the great physician. We're asking, oh God, for a revival that we once again might be restored in rightful relationship with you, that you might get the glory out of our lives. We're asking, oh God, that the word of God, the gospel will go forth with power, knowing that your word will not return void. And in our praying, Lord, we're asking that you would have mercy upon this world. Those who have been infected and affected by COVID-19, wherever there's human suffering, God, we ask that you would touch it right now, that you would bring about a turnaround and healing in this land. God, we love you and we thank you and we glorify your name. I pray for every member of Calvary that you would keep them safe within the center of your hands. We pray, oh God, for every church that's open in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray for those who do not know you, that they might come into a, a saving relationship with our savior, Jesus Christ. And for that, we say thank you in advance. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. And thank God. God bless you. During these times of uncertainty, not knowing what's going to happen from week to week or, or from month to month, there's one thing that we do know, that God's grace will keep us, His grace and His mercy always protect us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Listen.
is far by the grace of God. God's grace, His grace, God's grace, His grace. Yes, Lord, we made it this far. So many times I came so close Oh man, death tried to take me out So the reason I'm here It's not hard for me to see In fact, it's easy to explain It was God's grace God's grace Nothing but the grace of God His amazing grace your church will make it this far by the grace of God. Anybody want to know just how I got here? Anybody want to know just how I'm still standing? I'll tell you, I made it this far. I just couldn't take it but look at me now get down and some it's by the grace of God God's grace God's grace God's grace God's grace Good morning, Calvary Baptist Church. Pastor Oscar T. Moses here. Listen, it is Sunday morning, and we are excited because it's preaching time, and it's time to dig deep into the Word of God. Listen, we have a mantra here at Calvary that we say every Sunday before the preaching experience. You know what it is, but hold it. Make sure you have your Bibles. Make sure you have your smartphone or your iPad or whatever you have that you may read along with us. Are we ready? Aim fire. This is my Bible. There are many like it, but this one is mine. It is my weapon. It is my road map in enemy country. In my Bible is found the plan of salvation. Romans 10 and 9 says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God is raised from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. It is by our humility towards our Christ. Hospitality within our congregation. Hard work within our community that the unsaved would be one to Christ. Listen, I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament. Very small book in the Old Testament after the book of Nehemiah, and it is the book of Esther. Esther. It's a beautiful story in this book of Esther that is so relevant to this day in which we live. I want us to look at chapter number four of the book of Esther. And I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. But listen, I pray that in your quiet time, in your meditation, that you will go back to the book of Esther, chapter 4, and read the whole chapter in its entirety. But for sake of time and sensitivity of our task today, let's focus our semantic spotlight on verses 13 and 14. Are you with me? The word of God reads on this wise. Then Mordecai commanded to, an to answer Esther, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou 
and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. For such a time as this. I want to place a tag on this text this Sunday morning and use from a subject in which to preach the urgency of now. Hey, your life is calling you. I'm going to say that again. The urgency of now. Hey, your life is calling you. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this Sunday morning. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to connect with the church, even uh, via through Facebook or through social media. God, we know that this is the church's finest hour, that we're connecting not inside of a building, but in our individual homes that we're reaching out to connect with one another. Now, God, we ask that you would speak through this word today, that someone might see the urgency of the hour, and that we might hear and receive your word and apply it to our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. In the spring of 1986, from May to June, the movie Jojo Dancer hit the box office as a silver screen sensation at the tune of about $18 million from May to June. It became an instant smash. It was an auto semi-autobiographical sketch by the late Richard Pryor about the life of an up and coming comedian by the name of Jojo Dancer. Jojo Dancer comes from very humble beginnings, brought up in a brothel, uh, lived life on the edge. When he finally feels as though he's made it in life, then life comes tumbling down. And he finds himself in the ICU because of the freebasing incident where he gets burned up while freebasing cocaine. It's a strange twist of events because at the same time, uh, Richard Pryor himself tries to commit suicide by setting himself on fire. Jojo Dancer, while in ICU, uh, a conversation ensues between his spirit man and his past persona, and his life literally comes calling for him. And he's struggling as he brings back memories that emerge in his mind of how he's been brought up and how he, the mistakes that he made in life and what he thought was a, a success in, in comedy. And he ultimately comes to the conclusion that he's not even sure if living is worth it. Life has a strange way of getting our attention, doesn't it? In that same year, May 2nd, the late movie critic Gene Siskel, uh, Chicago Tribune, said some words that are forever etched in my mind as it relates to this movie, Jojo Dancer, Your Life is Calling You. That's the name of the movie. Siskel says that good movies take us to far away places. But he says great movies have a way of getting in our minds. Jojo Dance of Your Life is preaching for me. It's a good confessional movie because Richard Pryor looks over his life and he shows us his pain. He shows us his laughter. He shows us his embarrassment and he bears open the wounds of his life. He literally tells us where he came from. This is where I came from. This is what happened to me. This is what I did wrong. And this is how I'm going to get it right. Life comes calling you, and sometimes at the oddest and strangest of times. But when you discover why God has created you, Victor Frankl says in his logo therapy, that when you discover the why for living, you can endure almost anything. Mark Twain says there are two days that we should rejoice, the day that we're born and the day that we discover why we were born. The critical question is, how do you handle life when life says, hey, you, life is calling for you. This story this morning is a beautiful, simple Sunday school lesson, 575 years before the time of Christ. Uh, Jewish people were taken into Babylonian captivity from the high hills of Jerusalem. They were brought down to the lowlands of Babylon by the Chaldeans. Well, the Babylonian Empire eventually give, had given over to the Persian Empire. And the new king now has allowed a lot of the Jews to go back to the hills of Jerusalem. But some people were born in captivity and all they ever knew was Babylon. So there were a group of people that remained in Persia. And out of that group of people, there emerges this beautiful, this amazing story of a woman by the name of Esther. Esther was beautiful, but she was poor. She was an orphan raised by her cousin Mordecai. And Esther was 
although she was poor and although she was an orphan, she had this beauty that was amazing. And so one day as time would happen, as God has divined this story to unfold, the king is on the search for a wife and he chooses, you got it, Esther. He chooses Esther as his wife, not knowing that Esther is a Jew and Persians despise Jews. Esther's not telling them and she's now the queen. Well, one day her cousin Mordecai bumps into uh, the king's right hand man, Haman, who was an egomaniac. And because Mordecai did not bow, it enrages Haman. Haman goes to the king and convinces the king to do an ethnic cleansing to kill all of the Jews. Now, wait a minute. To kill all of the Jews, that's, that's Esther's people. And so Mordecai finds out, uh, cousin Mordecai finds out of the plot, the plan of this ethnic cleansing, the plan to destroy all the Jewish people. And he gets message to his cousin Esther, who is the queen in the palace. And he sends that message, letting her know that she has to do something. This is her time to save her people. And Esther responds with excuses. She says, I can't do that. My position is cush. I mean, I'm, I'm in, I'm, I'm in the circle. I'm, I'm the queen. And besides, there are two reasons why, why I cannot do anything. Number one, the king doesn't even know I'm a Jew. Number one. Number two, I haven't seen the king in a while. And you cannot, even the king's wife could not enter into his presence without an invitation. So those two things she sends back to cousin Mordecai, but Mordecai is not having it. He sends back another letter and he says, listen, you, you're in the, in the kingdom and you have the opportunity to go to the king on our behalf, on the behalf of your people. Now he says, if you don't do it, help will arise from another place. But for all you know, Esther, here it is. You've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Did you hear that? For such a time as this. That's the context in which we get that saying, for such a time as this. Esther's life has been called out for such a time as this. Now Esther gets the message and she responds in this dichotomy by saying to her cousin, this is what you do. You get all of the people, the men and women have them fast, no water, no food for three days. I'll get my maidens. I'll have them do the same for three days. After that, she says, if I perish, let me perish. But I'm going to see the king. I'm going to go because I realize that God has placed me in the kingdom for such a time as this. It's a beautiful lesson. It's a simple Sunday school lesson. There are some some tools, some nuggets that I want to pull out of this lesson. Then I'm going to give you some, some points and we'll be done. This, this lesson is divinely designed for us this morning. And it teaches us that God created all of us to solve a problem. And he sends us to the world with the tools that we need to assure that that problem will be solved. He sends Esther to the world. He creates Esther for a specific time. There was a problem that needed to be solved, a people that needed to be saved, and a person that needed to be sent. In this instance, it was Esther. And Esther was sent to the kingdom for such a time as, as this. And he gives her all that she needs to have influence during that time. Number one, not only does this text teaches us that God creates us or he sends us to solve, to solve a problem, but second of all, this text is, 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 is preaching all over it. It says your problem will eventually call you out. The problem that you were created to solve, it will eventually call you out. Walk with me because there was a problem uh, even before the time of, there was a problem down in Egypt. <clears throat> And the people of God were put in the slave, a hard slave taskmaster. And Moses runs from his problem, gets to the backside of the Midian, on the backside of the Midian, tending his grandfather Jethro's flock. When God says, hey, you, <laughs> you can't run from me. Life is calling you. And God calls Moses out to solve a problem and to deliver three million people from the flesh pots of Egypt across the Red Sea where he rolls back the gates of the Red Sea just like that. God says, hey, you, and he calls Moses out. But there's another problem that God saw because Africans were being taken from the from the, from the motherland on ships through chattel slavery over into this land. And then because there was a problem that needed to be solved, 
people that needed to be saved and the person that needed to be sent. There was a little woman, Black Moses, a.k.a. Harriet Tubman, because God said, hey, you, life is calling you. And she led thousands of slaves um, free through the Underground Railroad during the time of dog whistle politics, still dog whistle politics. But racism, big stick diplomacy, and at the height of the Southern strategy, God says, hey, you, to a little woman trying to, to, a little woman trying to get on the bus. And he calls out uh, the birth of Rosa Parks, the mother of the civil rights movement. At the same time, there was a young preacher, 26 years old, wanted nothing to do with the movement. God says, hey, you. And he calls Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., into the movement. Listen to what happens in the text. Mordecai calls his own cousin out. He calls her into accountability because he recognized that God has called her to the kingdom for such a time as this. Not only does God call or create us to solve a problem, not only will your problem call you out, but third of all, if you don't create, the, if you don't solve the problem, God has someone else that will. Mordecai tells Esther that you were created for such a time as this, but in the event that you don't, help would arise from someplace else. Come here, Elijah. I wanted him to be here this morning, but he couldn't. But he learned a hard lesson that God has somebody, even if he will not solve the problem. After Elijah had been successful on Mount Carmel, came down and ran for his life, found himself in the cave. He tells God, I'm the only one left, God. <laughs> I'm all you get. And God said, no, you're not, Elijah. I have 7,000 prophets that have not bowed to Baal. And so what I'll do is I'll move you into an early retirement and we'll throw your mantle on Elisha and Elisha will take your place. If you don't solve the problem, God has someone else to solve the problem. Here's the shout in this text that whatever God has called you to do, even as he called Esther for such a time as this, whatever God has assigned to your hands, here is the lesson. It's worth dying for. Watch the movements in this text. Esther ultimately comes to the conclusion, I'm going to see the king. And if I perish, let me perish. But I'm going to see the king. This is a beautiful text because it's a clear cut path, clear -cut path to Calvary. It is uh, Esther. It presents herself as a type of Christ. There's Calvary. There's shouting all over this text because Esther is a type of Christ in that she has become an intercessor for her people. And Christ willingly died for his people. He was willing to give his life that you and I might have access. Esther could not even go her own self to the throne of the king, which, is her, which was her husband. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, we have that problem, no longer have that problem. We now all who are believers of Christ, that believe that he died, was buried, and rose again, we have access to the throne of grace. I feel like shouting right by myself right through here because it lets me know that I don't have to go through nobody to get to God. I can go directly to my, by myself. Why am I preaching this? Because life sets us up to be a, a, a solution to a problem. Life sets us up to solve problems. Just when we think things are going the way we want them to go, life says, hey, you, there's a problem over here. Hey, you, there's a problem over here. Who am I talking to? Because we need to understand that there is no problem that God has not already created a solution. Did you hear what I said? There is no problem that God has not already created the solution. COVID-19 is a problem, but God has already created the solution. Institutional racism is a problem, but God has already created a solution. Poverty, homelessness. Hopelessness, it's a problem. But for all you know, God is calling you for such a time as this. Here is the question. How do we handle life when life comes calling? Because I believe I'm talking to someone who's looking back at me now and you're saying, yeah, Reverend, 
I don't want to admit it, but I know God is. You can't sleep at night because God is trying to call you to solve a problem. If we are born again, if we are Christians, God has given all of us a spiritual gift. And that gift that he's given us is to solve a problem. Let me say this. I'm glad that God made me a preacher. There was a time when I didn't even want to do this, but I'm glad. And preaching is what I do. You wake me up at five o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. I can preach because the Lord has given me preaching power for such as time as this. Here it is. Whatever God calls you to do, do that. Don't worry about trying to do everything else. If God called you to do one thing, do that one thing. Well, I'm glad God made me a preacher. He did not make me no politician. He did not make me a community developer. He did not uh, make me, uh, uh, he did not make me a uh, uh, president of, of the Busy Bee Club. He made me a preacher. Here it is, Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish theologian says that the enemy of simplicity is duplicity. It's the inability to do one thing. And the Bible tells us that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his way, all of his ways. Whatever God has called you to do, whatever life calls you, whatever problem God has called you to solve. Do it the way God told you to do it. Because if you do it the way he told you to do it, once it's done, can't nobody else undo what you did. Did you hear what I said? Preach, O.T. Moses. I'm doing the best I can, Lord. Here is the question. How do we respond to life's num callings? Number one, I'm in the text. Number one, look at what Esther does. And you'll discover what not to do. The first thing we got to understand, the first point here it is, wake up and write it down. Stop making excuses. Esther begins by making excuses. I can't do it. My position is cush. I might get in trouble. I might expose myself. Stop. There comes a time when you have to say, yeah, God, I, this is what you call me to do. I'm the one. Can't nobody do it but me. You, you've created me for such a time as this. This is my finest hour. I have to stop making excuses. I'm talking to somebody who's looking back at me. No matter how minimal you think your assignment is, no matter how small you think it is, nobody can do what God has called you to do but you. Stop making excuses. Esther learns a powerful lesson to stop making excuses. There, there's another lesson in this. Um, use what you get. I like that. I, I like use what you get. God made Esther pretty on purpose. Mm, mm, mm. He he knew that her beauty would be the key or the linchpin to getting her into the kingdom. I don't care. You may not look like Esther. You may not. You may not look like that. But use what you got. You understand. If you only got one tooth, brush that tooth every day. Use what you got. If God gave you one sermon, preach that sermon until heaven gets the news. Use what you got. If you got one song to sing, sing that song like Beethoven composed music, like Mozart composed music, like Michelangelo, sweet, sweet streets, like, like, like it's the last thing you, that you could do if that's what God has called you to do. Use what you've got. Give God the glory for what he's given to you. I told you, number one, stop making excuses. Use what you got. Number three, do good. Life is not all about you. It's about helping others. It's about being a source of strength, a source of aid, a source of comfort to other people. It's about sacrificing your own life that others might have life. Let me give you a side order of scripture with these texts. Number one, I told you uh, to stop making excuses. Second Corinthians 5.10. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to give it to you so you'll have some homework to go and study. Stop making excuses. Second Corinthians 5 and 10. Use what you get. First Peter chapter four, verse number 10. Then I told you thirdly, do good. Psalm 37 and three. I'm done. But you have to make sure that you keep your spiritual connection with God. When I'm ever, whenever I'm in Illinois and I listen to WVON talk radio, if I get too far out of the radio, the radius of, of, uh, the signal, I can't catch nothing. All I'm saying is that don't get too, don't get far out of the will of God when you can't hear him like you used to hear him, like when you, when you can't pray like you used to pray. You have to stay within the will of God. God loves us and there's nothing you can do about it. Do what he called you to do. I'm done. But here's the thing I want to tell you that there are three callings that God has over all of our lives. When he says, Hey, you, first of all, he calls us to purpose. That when God created us, 
he had an idea in mind. There's a people to be saved, a problem to be solved, and a person to be sent. What's your problem? There's a problem that you have. There's a problem with your name all over it that God has sent you to solve. You have purpose in life. You've got to discover what that is. It's not your decision. It is your discovery where God unfolds the problem that he created you to solve. God calls us to purpose. God calls, calls us to purpose, but then also God calls us to productivity. He calls us to be fruitful with these hands. He calls us to, to live a life of working. That whatever work we find to our hands, that we'll do it well. That our life's work would glorify the kingdom. I told you the call to purpose, the call to productivity. But then there's a third call for the Christian. For the believer in God, there's a call to paradise. The old folk used to sing it like this. When he calls me, I'll answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Hey, you, life is calling you. I certainly pray something was said to help you along the way in that message. Brothers and sisters, the message is simply a reminder that God has called you for such a time as this. Everyone that's listening to me right now under the sign of my voice, of my voice, you have an assignment in this life. And if you don't carry it out, you'll have to answer before our creator. Hey, life is calling you. I don't want to take for granted that everyone here that is, that's listening, that you have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth shall not perish, but have an everlasting life. To believe that God loved us so much that even in our sins, the sins we have committed, are committing, or will commit, that Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary died for our sins. He stood in our place and took our punishment because there is a penalty for sin, but Jesus paid that penalty for us on the cross of Calvary. That's what salvation means, that we've been rescued from eternal damnation to eternal salvation in Christ Jesus. God loves you and he's calling you right now for such a time as this. Brothers and sisters, as we come back week after week with these broadcasts and as we operate throughout the course of the week, I don't want us to forget, once again, our financial responsibility to the church. For those of you that are listening, for those of you that are joining in, we certainly welcome your contributions and we thank you for supporting this ministry. But the members of Calvary, we have a responsibility as members to support the church with our tithe and offerings. After this broadcast has gone off. You will see um, the mode or the need medium in which we can share our contributions. And listen, Calvary, thank you for being so consistent. Calvary Baptist Church, you are a great church. You've been consistent even during this crisis with sending in your tithes and your offering. And for that, we are thankful. We have a great church. This is a great time, whether we believe it or not, for the church to shine. God bless you and God keep you is my prayer.